Dr. Brooke is the executive director of the Ayn Rand Institute and a leading advocate of Rand's ideas. A former finance professor, he speaks internationally on such topics as the causes of the financial crisis, the morality of capitalism, and the ending the growth of the state. Dr. Brooke received his MBA and PhD in finance from the University of Texas at Austin. For seven years, he was an award-winning finance professor at Santa Clara University. And in 1998, he co-founded a financial advisory firm, BH Equity Research, at which he is presently managing director and chairman. In 2000, Dr. Brooke left teaching to become the executive director of the Ayn Rand Institute and a go-to source for laissez-faire policy. Dr. Brooks' field of specialties include objectivism, capitalism, finance, business ethics, venture capital, economics, and foreign policy. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Dr. Yaron Brook. Thank you, radicals. <laughs> So I just want to say something about the, the book project that was discussed uh, earlier. So the Ayn Institute offers every English teacher in the United States free books if they promise to teach Ayn Rand, right? And we did this about eight years ago and we thought, eh, you know, a few teachers here and there would take us up on this and we'd send out a few thousand copies maybe and that would be great. Last year we shipped over 400,000 books. 400,000 books. So we think, we think about a million kids are reading Ayn Rand in high school every year, which to me is a revolution, right? Think 10 years in the future, 10 million kids exposed to these ideas. Um, even if just a fraction of them get it, right, because they're so brain dead by the time they reach ninth grade that only a fraction can get it, um, it's still, it's huge. That's the revolution. So. Uh, Great idea here, you know, to support it locally in Colorado and get as me as much coverage as we can for high schools in Colorado. But I'm not here to pitch Iron Man's book, so I'm here to pitch mine. <laughs> but, and mine's for sale, not no freebies. Yeah. Um, so the book, the book is a mystery story, right? You didn't know that, right? And this is the mystery. The mystery is that we all know something. The, the evidence for something is, is, is really, really clear. So what is the something? The evidence for capitalism, the evidence for freedom, the evidence of free markets is like right in our face. It's so obvious that capitalism works. It's so obvious that free markets work. That the mystery is, why are we losing? So just think about the evidence, right? We've been running an experiment for 200 years, 200 years. And it's all over the world we've been running this experiment. We've been running an experiment across time, across different geographies. And the experiment is what social, political, economic system produces the highest standard of living, creates wealth, creates a rising tide? Where do the poor live best? Where do the middle class live best? Where does everybody live best, right? And we've tried everything. We've tried radical communism, right? We've tried communism. And we know that sucks, right? We know that's awful. Hundreds, over 100 million people die under communism. It's a slaughterhouse. We've tried fascism. We know that doesn't work. We know millions of people die under that system. So we've tried the left's radical ideas, by the way, both fascism and social and communism are leftist ideas, right? We've tried different, you know, degrees of capitalism. When we try the greatest degree of capitalism, now we've never tried it in its pure form, but we got pretty close in America in the 19th century, in a few other places around the world. What happens when we try it? We boom. Economic growth takes off. Employment, I mean, capitalism, when tried, creates more jobs than there are people. That's why capitalist countries can absorb huge numbers of immigrants, which they do. Standard of livings go up. During the 19th century in the United States, real income doubled twice. Real income right now is slightly rising over the last 30 years, barely, barely. <laughs> Stand of livings exploded. Middle class was created. 
And we tried all the mixtures, right? We've tried a little bit of freedom and a lot of uh, statism and a lot of, you know, freedom and some statism. We've tried all these variations. And there's a huge correlation between freedom and standard living. Freedom, wealth creation, freedom, and how poor the, how the poor do. They do better. And it's, you know, it's right there in front of us. It's in the history books. Well, maybe not. But it's in the history. Put it that way. I mean, why is it in the history books? That's a good question. Bill Ayers. <laughs> yes. But why are we let him give why does he have the power? Why do all these bastards have the power, right? Why does the left dominate our history books? Why does the left dominate our schools and dominate our academia? Because the history is obvious. And if you don't believe the history, all you have to do, my favorite place on the planet other than the United States, just in terms of visual representation of the success of freedom and capitalism is the small rock in the middle of nowhere called Hong Kong. Anybody been to Hong Kong? You got, before you die, <laughs> I'm not kidding, before you die you have to go see this place. It is out of this world. Here's a rock in the middle of nowhere that had nothing on it. A hundred years ago there was a little fishing village there, nothing else. Today, it has skyscrapers all over the rock. Over seven million people live on this rock. And they are hustling and bustling. There's not a person there who's sitting still. They're working hard. And how did they get to this rock? Well, they escaped every other Asian country in the area. Some of them swam there. Many of them came by raft or by dinky little boats, risking their lives to get there. And the amazing thing about this place, Hong Kong, is when they came there, there was no safety net. There was no social security. There was no Medicare or Medicaid. There was no welfare. You made it, or you stopped, or you were dependent on charity, but you had to make it. And they swam to get there from places where the government guaranteed everything and gave you everything. Here's this testament to capitalism, right in front of our faces. It's right there. You'd rather live the, you know what the standard, the, the um, is it average, uh, average um, GDP per capita. Average GDP per capita in Hong Kong is the same as the United States. Same as the United States. No natural resources. Nothing. Except for one thing, they have freedom. So here it is. You, you just have to go there and you can see it. You can see the wealth. You can see the excitement. You can see the, the buzz. Just look at all the stuff made there. So the question is, the mystery is, why don't we learn? Right, when the Berlin, you know, kids today don't know that the Berlin Wall was put up to prevent West Berliners from fleeing to East Berlin, right? <laughs> the South Kent East Berlin was better or something? It was put up to prevent East Berliners from fleeing to the West. And yet, we want to become East Berlin. We don't. They do. Bold is that way? They certainly do. Right? I was just in Europe at a conference in Prague. And uh, this was a kind of a free market uh, conference. And the president of Prague is a free market guy who, um, who fought communism. When he lived under communism, fought it. Became prime minister after communism fell, and today's the, today the president of the republic. I've never heard a more depressing talk than the talk he gave. Here's a guy who lived under communism. He knows what authoritarianism, what statism, what you know, complete obliteration of the individual is. And yet he's saying that Europe today is heading in that direction. That the fact that they brought down the Berlin Wall when it came down, they were so optimistic, they were so thrilled, they thought the future was theirs for the taking. And they, they, they did some amazing reforms in places like the Czech Republic. And today, this is coming from the president of the country, he says, it's all drifting backwards. It's all going in the other direction. In spite of the fact that they know. They know what the other direction means. We know what socialism means. We know what statism means. You just have to go look around the world and you can see it. 
This is not rocket science. You know, uh, uh, we do the same thing. We don't learn from experience. We don't learn from history. We don't learn from fact. Right? How many times have we tried to stimulate the economy? <laughs> well, around the world. We've tried it hundreds of times, all over the world. In the Great Depression, we tried it. Japan's been trying it for over 20 years now. Bush tried it. Bush tried it, by the way, the first time Bush tried it. Anybody know when the first Bush stimulus was? In 2001, I think. 2001, two as we were heading into recession after the dot-com bubble. And then he tried it again in 2000, it didn't work then. Tried it again in 2008, didn't work, work then. But it was small, it was only 300 billion. 300 billion in 2008, so Obama came in and said, oh, we'll try it again, this time we'll do it 900 billion, because it's, size matters, I guess. It's all that matters. <laughs> of course, it failed too, but that doesn't prevent anybody from wanting another one now. We tried QE1, didn't work. QE2 didn't work, so let's try QE3. Right? We've tried Keynesian and economics over and over and over again, never works. It doesn't work anywhere it's tried, but let's keep trying it. There's a pattern here. People don't learn. And the question is why? Because this is the key. Why don't people learn from history? Why don't people learn from observing the facts? Why don't people learn from economics? From the experience of economics? It's because all of our thinking about these things, all of our thinking about history, about economics, about reality, about facts, is today in our culture shaped by much more fundamental beliefs. We don't deal with facts as facts. We are so brainwashed in a particular ideologies that we take the facts and somehow distort them into fitting our theories. But our theories come first. And the question is, what are these theories? What are these philosophical theories that if we don't challenge, we lose because they keep cramming, they keep distorting. You know, what is Keynesian, Keynesian if successful? Nobody believes in Keynesian economics. Not even the Keynesians. <laughs> they don't. Because the facts are not consistent with what their theory is. Nothing is consistent with it. So why do they believe in it? Because what they do believe in, and I'll take just a, a superficial kind of idea, they believe that the market will always fail, and they believe that government has to be the solution. There is only one economic theory that states that in economic terms, and that's Keynesianism. And the fact that it doesn't work doesn't matter because they want, they want to believe that markets fail and government is the answer, and they will lie to you about the economic theory just to justify growing government and repressing repressing markets. They don't care whether it works or not, as long as government grows and as long as markets shrink. That's their objective. That's what Paul Krugman cares about. He doesn't, he, he knows, right, he's an economist. He actually won Nobel, Nobel Prize for Economics on a paper he did 20 years ago, which is pretty good. It's an ad advocacy for free trade. He doesn't believe in free trade anymore. Because he's about government, he's not about economics. He's about growing government, shrinking markets. We know it doesn't work, we've tried this before. So what is it? What is it that causes us to suspect markets, to want markets to shrink and to grow government? What is it about markets that we resent, that the culture resents, that is so deeply enshrined in the culture that they refuse to look at facts? that they refuse to open their eyes to the facts of history, geography, economics. And what is it about government that's so appealing? That they're willing again to ignore facts, they're willing to ignore history, and let it grow. Well, what, what, is, what are markets about? What's capitalism about? Personal responsibility. Well, it's about personal responsibility, but for what? What, what do we go into the marketplace for? Uh, you know, when we go to... Profit. 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 Yeah. Value. Why does he make one of these? What, is he, what does Steve Jobs make these for? To live. To live. To live, to live meaning for the money, to profit. To live meaning because he loves it and it's part of his passion. He values this. This is fun. And he makes a lot of money. What's the profit margin on these? It's like the originals were like 60% profit margins. Right? 
So if he really cared about me, he would have sold it a lot cheaper, but he doesn't. When he goes and makes these, who's he caring about? Himself. Steve Jobs and his shareholders and employees. The people at Apple, that's who he cares about. When you go to work, you're trying to make a living for whom? For your neighbor? For the Social Security recipients? For welfare recipients? You go in there for make yourself better. You go in there because you love it. I hope you all love your jobs. It's important in life. You're going there to make a living. You're going there to make your life better. Now, when I went and bought my first iPhone, it was 2008, and the economy was spiraling out of control. And I went and bought my iPhone because I wanted to stimulate the economy. Because <laughs> that's why you go at the mall, right? You guys all go at the mall to stimulate the economy? To help your fellow man, make sure their jobs. So when we go into the marketplace as producer, worker, and as consumer, buyer, what are we trying to do? Make our life better. We're pursuing what? Happiness. 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 Simpler than happiness. We're pursuing our self-interest. You can't even say it. <laughs> We're pursuing our self-interest. We're being self-interested. We're being selfish. When we go to work, we're going because it's good for us. We're not there to maximize social utility. We're not there to take care of our neighbor. We go to the mall to make ourselves look better, feel better, be more productive. That's why we go buy stuff. We go to work to make ourselves have more money, to enjoy ourselves, to have fun, to gain self-esteem, to challenge ourselves. But it's all about me. me. It is. The marketplace is a place where people go to pursue their self-interest. Go to any market, right? Go, go, to the, go to the markets in the Middle East where they're haggling all this stuff. Why are they haggling? Because each one wants to pursue their own self-interest. And they want to make sure the other guy's not screwing them. <laughs> markets are nakedly, unabashed, well, they're somewhat bashful about this, but they're nakedly about self-interest. They're about people pursuing their self-interest. And yet, what do we know about self-interest? When we're this big, what does our mother tell us about self-interest? Share. Share. Be selfless. Sacrifice is good. Don't be selfish. Don't be first in line. Always take care of others first. Now, no mother actually believes any of that. <laughs> but that's what they teach us. Because that's the moral code that we believe in. We believe in a moral code that places its emphasis not on producing, not on creating, not on self-responsibility, not on pursuing your own happiness or your own success or your own money or your own profit, but on others, on taking care of others, on being your brother's keeper, on sacrificing. What does a sacrifice mean? You give and what do you get in return? Nothing. Nothing. Or less. Or less. What is a trade? Who lost when I bought the iPhone? Nobody. Nobody. What was it then? You lost your bank account. I lost my bank account, but what did I gain? <laughs> a functional device. A functional device worth less, it cost me 300 bucks. More or less than 300 bucks. It's more. worth more to me. That's why I gave up 300 bucks. And to Apple, is it worth more or less? Less, because they made a profit. Who lost? Nokia. Nobody. Nobody. Nokia, yeah. Well, maybe. <laughs> Nobody lost. Win-win. Win-win. Trade, when people are pursuing their own self-interest, it's win-win. But what's moral? Morality is not about win-wins. Win-wins are outside of morality. Morality is about sacrifice. Sacrifice is win lose win, right? You lose because you get less in return or nothing in return. Other person, so we think morality, we think morally, <coughs> lose wins are good. Win wins, eh, we don't like that much. I mean, you laugh, but this is true, right? Bill Gates is making billions of dollars building a product, marketing and selling a product worldwide, affecting the lives of every human being on the planet. Every human being on the planet was affected by Microsoft. Right? All of our lives are better off for Microsoft. He made gazillions of dollars. From a mob perspective, what do we think of him? Oh, he's a great genius. 
<laughs> bad or neutral. We certainly don't think he's morally noble, a good guy. Now, when do we think he's a good guy? When he gives it away. When he gives it away, right? So now he's giving it away. Creating the wealth, that gives you no points in the morality sphere. Giving it away, now you get points. Now I know how to get Bill Gates sainthood. I haven't talked to the Pope yet. But I can guarantee that from our culture's perspective, he would gain sainthood. What would he have to do? Give it all away. Move into a tent, because he lives in a nice house now. He might be enjoying giving this money away, so we have to be suspicious. He has to move into a tent, and if he could show some blood, if he could show some suffering, some real suffering, he becomes a saint. That's what we value in the culture we live in. From an ethical perspective, we value suffering, sacrifice, giving away. We don't value creating, building, profit, pursuing one's self-interest. Now again, this is like your mother. All of us, don't, we don't want to sacrifice, we want to go trade and go to the mall. But again, it's how we code that. It's how we, what our attitude is. Because this is the key, and this is to the politicians in the room. People do not vote their pocketbook. People do not vote standard of living, jobs, wealth. They don't vote any of that stuff. Otherwise, Obama would have never got elected, but neither would it most Republicans in the last 50 years. Because none of them have given us any of that. Right? People vote what they think is just, what they think is fair, what they think is right, what they think is moral. Right? The left has produced only disaster in this country financially, but they've gained them all high ground. Nobody challenges that what they think is right, that what they think is just. Nobody challenges that. Except us. <laughs> what we challenge is we argue, oh, but I can create 12 million jobs and you only create 2 million jobs. Nobody cares if what, the way I do it is unjust and unfair and he's being just and fair. People want morality. They want to feel like they're doing good. They want to feel like they're doing just. And they hate capitalism. Because capitalism, while it produces the goods, it's unjust. It's unfair. People are win-wins. People are making a lot of money. There's wealth. is all over the place. Some people are rich. Some people are poor. Nobody's sacrificing. Not giving back. Giving back as if you took something, right? Not giving enough. It's completely skewed. A whole moral code. The whole moral code of the left is completely skewed against capitalism and nobody challenges it. On moral ground. Nobody. So think about, think about a culture that when you're making billions of dollars doesn't think much of you. But if you give it up, thinks you're a hero. Well, do we want to create a marketplace in which more people can create a bunch? No, because that's not a noble good activity. What are politicians? Are politicians out for profit? Oh. Yes, they are. Public servants. <laughs> no, they're public servants. They're in it for the common good. They're in it for the public welfare. At least that's the selling point, right? And we buy it. Why do we trust? Why do we trust? So here's, here's a, an example of this, right? You've got two types of bankers in the United States. You've got the bankers on Wall Street, you know, the guys who run Citibank and uh, Wells Fargo and uh, J.P. Morgan and, and so on. You got, you got, and how, how does the culture treat them? What, what, do we trust them? No, no we, we, I mean, they're the biggest villains in the world. But then we have this other banker. He, he, he actually has the most powerful financial institution in the universe. At least in, our, in the known universe. Known to us. Yeah, Bernanke, Greenspan, Volcker, I don't care. Whoever it happens to be, right? The Federal Reserve is, not, is much more powerful than Citibank. It can do more, more damage than any bank in the world. 
right? Who do we trust more? The guy who runs the Federal Reserve or the guy who runs Citibank? I mean, I'm not talking about you guys. As a culture, who do we trust more? Bernanke. Why? What is it about Bernanke that we trust more? He's a public servant. He's doing this for the common good. He's got a very low bonus. He doesn't have a profit margin. He has no profits, right? The Federal Reserve does, it makes a huge profit, but they don't actually pay it out. We trust not for profits. But the guy at Citibank, oh, well, he's just greedy and selfish and he's out to make a lot of money. We don't trust him. So when a financial crisis happens, are we going to blame it on Greenspan? Or are we going to blame it on the Lehman Brothers, the Goldman Sachs, or whoever's on Wall Street? We're not going to blame it on Greenspan because he's just a public, he's doing his best, trying to help the common man. And these bankers, they're just greedy, making a gazillions of dollars. And yet it turns out that Alan Greenspan is a thousand times more responsible for the financial crisis than any banker or all the bankers combined on Wall Street. But we'll never blame him because we've got these greedy bastards to go after. Every time there's an economic crisis, instinctually the culture goes, it must be the bankers, it must be the financiers, it must be capitalists. Why? Because they don't trust self-interest. They don't trust profit. And why don't they trust it? So there are two aspects of this which we cover in the book. One is, we just talked about, the morality that we hold dear as a culture is the morality of what I call the morality of need. We need to help those who need stuff. Right? How do we get into the healthcare mess we're in today? Well, there was a small group one day of really, really poor people or really, really old people who weren't getting as good a healthcare as everybody else and they really needed better healthcare. And they came to us on their knees groveling and really asking, please give us more healthcare. So the government said, sure, you really need it. And uh, you know, all of us said, yeah, we'll help them just, one, just this one time, right? We'll all vote for it because we feel a little guilty that we didn't take care of them before. So we'll all agree to have our taxes raised so that we can take care of them. And you call that Medicare, Medicaid. They were pretty small in the 1960s, no big deal. And then soon enough, there's another group that didn't quite qualify for those programs, but they're not getting as good a health care as they should get, and they need it. So how can we say no? My favorite example of this is because it's the most emotionally wrenching, right? There are kids who didn't qualify under Medicare and whose parents weren't quite wealthy enough supposedly to buy health insurance and therefore these kids were not covered by any health insurance plan. And they're kids and they're getting sick and they have no insurance. How can you say no? Isn't it your moral responsibility, moral duty to help them? And if your answer is yes, which I'm sure in your head most of you, the answer is yes, then you're doomed, you're finished. Because once you help them, there's no end to it. Once you use government to help them, there's no end to it. That's called CHIP, C-H-I-P, which is still being fought because it keeps expanding because those poor kids, that group keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And who passed it? Was it Democrats? Was it Obama? 1986, Ronald Reagan. You can't resist this stuff. Republicans give the more high ground to the left, and then they can't, they always capitulate. It's just a question of which poor group, which needy group are we going after now? They just shift around, but there's always a needy group that needs something from you. And nobody ever stops it. Remember, George Bush passed uh, Medicare Part D, the biggest expansion of the welfare state since Johnson. So we blame Obama. I mean, it's, what's the difference? At the end of the day, oh, there's a difference, but I mean, really think about it. They all share the same all high ground. So that's one side of it, right? The side that says need, and that comes from this morality that says your life is not your own. You owe as a moral responsibility to every child who comes up to you and says, I need something. You owe it to them. It's your moral duty. You're not a good human being unless you help that child. Of course, there's no end to that, you realize, because there are millions of children out there in the world who need something from you, and you're all not giving it to them. So all, please feel guilty for all the children in Africa who are not getting what you have. But that's the mall code. But they have a, they have a, that's not enough. They have another little gimmick under their sleeves. And the other gimmick is, that's a mall code 
that if actually stated explicitly, you need to sacrifice to your neighbor, and eh, nobody's completely comfortable with that. But the alternative is to live for yourself. The alternative is to be self-interested. But what, what are we taught about self-interest? It's bad. Why is it bad? What does it lead to? Greed. Greed. And what does greed lead to? Excess. Excess. And what does excess mean? <laughs> right? These are all words that are just replacing one another. What does it actually mean? What kind of behavior do we associate with people pursuing their self-interest that we hate? Legitimately hate. Yeah, so the idea is that self-interested people lie, cheat, steal, do anything they can to get whatever they can, whenever they can from everybody else. They exploit other people. This is the idea that Bernie Madoff is self-interested. Bernie Madoff is greedy. Right? Bernie Madoff is selfish. But is Bernie Madoff self-interested? If self-interest is about taking care of self, did Bernie Madoff take care of himself? In a very short term, but not in the long term. I mean, even assume he was, he'd never be caught. He lived a miserable, pathetic life. How many of you ever lied? Don't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Lying is a stupid strategy. It's bad. You don't gain anything from lying. It's destructive. It's actually destructive to your own ability to, to live, to live well. I mean, I at my age have a hard time remembering what actually happens. <laughs> I mean, ask me where I was last week. It takes me a while to figure that out. Now, I'm gonna get caught in this. Um, now imagine I lied. Now I have to remember what happened and what didn't happen, what I lied. And who I lied to, and when I lied to, and who I didn't lie to, and who I told the truth. For every event that happens in the world, once you lie, you have to remember 55 other things. It's impossible to do, and, it's inc and you get caught. You almost inevitably get caught. One lie always leads to more lies. It screws you up, and it screws up your mind. It screws up your ability to tell the truth and to live a truthful life. Lying's not a self-interested strategy. Cheating's not self-interested. There's no way you actually gain values from cheating or stealing. But you see, they tell us that self-interest necessarily leads to lying, cheating, and stealing. So who wants to be self-interested? Nobody, because nobody wants to be a lying, stealing, cheating SOB. Nobody wants it, so we all resist it. Now we call this the argument from greed. Now, if you believe that everybody is lying, cheating, stealing, what do you want to do if all businessmen, because we know businessmen are self-interested, right? They're after profits. That everybody in the culture knows. So if you believe that profit motive and self-interest lead to lying, stealing, and cheating, what do we need to do to, to, to make sure they don't do this? It starts with an R. Regulate. Regulate. You gotta regulate. You ever notice every time you walk into an elevator, there's a little diploma there that says that a government bureaucrat has certified that the elevator <laughs> won't fall and kill you. <laughs> because we know. We know that those greedy elevator manufacturers, if not for the government, they would, be ele they would build elevators that killed the people who were in them. <laughs> because that's how you make money in business, by creating defective products that kill your customers. <laughs> All regulations are based on that one principle. All of them. Just think elevator inspectors every time you see a regulation. <laughs> they assume that you are going to lie, steal, cheat, cut corners, think short term, not care about your customers. Not Why do we have employment law? All these employment laws. Because we know that if the government didn't care about employees, we would chain them to their machines and whip them three times. <laughs> because that's how you get productivity out of <laughs> it. Is, I mean, we laugh, but it's true. It's exactly true. When uh, in 2000, anybody remember uh, Sabine's Oxley? Yeah, some of you have experienced it, I can tell. Cost the US economy somewhere around 1.5 to $2 trillion of real GDP. Um, it was passed because they caught a few CEOs who were lying, cheating, and stealing, right? Uh, CEO of Enron, WorldCom, Tyco, a few others. And the conclusion was, what? Everybody's a crook. 
I was on Bill O'Reilly's show. Remember Bill O'Reilly? <laughs> you guys probably watch him. He's the guy that sticks his finger out in the wind, figures out where the wind is blowing, and takes that position. <laughs> Bill O'Reilly has no principles, none whatsoever, except Bill O'Reilly's ratings. Um, He's selfish. No, I don't think so. He looks too miserable to be selfish. Selfishness is supposed to lead you to happiness. I'll talk about that in a minute. I don't think Bill is happy, a happy guy. If you've ever watched those unedited segments where he yells at his yeah. producers and stuff, the guy's nasty. Um, anyway, I was at this show, 2002, right after World Cup, and one of those guys. And, and, and Bill O'Reilly wanted to fire every CEO in America. That was his shtick, right? Fire everyone. I was there to defend the CEOs who weren't caught stealing because I thought, you know, in this country you're still innocent until proven guilty. But not according to Bill. Not according to our culture. And that's why we passed Sarbanes-Oxley. Sarbanes-Oxley is a, is, is, is a big law meant to put a bureaucrat on every business's shoulder and follow the books and, and look at every number, every entry, everything. It's created so much bureaucracy in corporate America. It's, it, it's, it's mind-boggling. It's hard to imagine. Every company a receivership. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it's, 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 it's tyranny. It's exactly that. How many crooks has Sarbanes actually caught? None. None. Zero. Did it prevent the financial crisis? No. 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 It was supposed to. Right? No, but is anybody talking about repealing it? No. Nobody. Nobody. One little segment of it that has to do with IPOs, but nothing else. Nothing else. By the way, the IPO deal is a big deal because it's so expensive now to become a public company in the United States that it's cheaper to go to Asia or to Europe to IPO there rather than IPO in the U.S. And a lot of European companies delisted from American exchanges so they wouldn't have to deal with sovereigns. It's, it's just such a horrific legislation, it's hard to believe. But that's because of this assumption. It's the elevator inspector. They must all be crooks because they're all self-interested. That's the equation in our mind. Now, that to me, that combination, need, greed, that combination is what shapes Everybody's thinking about this world. Nobody waits to see what are the economic causes of the financial crisis. It's obvious. It's the greed of Wall Street. Nobody needs to think too much about how to take care of the uninsured. Well, we need, we've got people here who have money. It's their moral responsibility to help these guys. We're not hurting them, we're just helping them become better people. Right? <laughs> I'm raising your taxes, now you're doing more, right? You're not giving enough. Now you give more. You're just helping people. It's your moral duty to do it. I'm just enforcing that duty. Patriotic. Patriotic. Well, it's noble. It's goodness. Unless we, come, we challenge these two arguments, we cannot win. And we will not win. And nobody, nobody on the right is challenging these arguments. Because they go to the core of what we believe. As Republicans, Democrats, it doesn't matter. Because it goes to the core of what morality is about, what ethics is about. So my argument is that we need a revolution, an intellectual revolution, but not an economic, not an economic thinking. The economics will come; they're relatively easy. Not even in politics. The politics will come; it's relatively easy. The hard revolution. But the revolution that shapes everything else is a moral revolution. What we need to do is scrap the morality we have today. Scrap the idea that your life is there to serve others. That you are your brother's keeper. That the whole point of morality is to regulate your behavior towards other people. That morality leads to nothing but statism. It leads to nothing but authoritarianism in the end. There's no better way, by the way, to control people than to tell them your moral responsibility, your moral duty, everything in your life needs to revolve about helping them. And by the way, I know how to help them. So I'll tell you how to do it. Every dictator, every tribal leader, everybody who wanted to enslave people always used that term. Every statist tells you your life is not yours. He knows how to... He knows how to get you to heaven, whatever the heaven is. He knows how to do it. Just listen to him. 
And it always means sacrificing yourself to the tribe. Define the tribe however you want. But it's always a tribe. That needs to be scrapped. This is what Ayn Rand is about. You might read Atlas Shrugged and see politics, economics. That's not what it's about. It's about morality. It's about her rediscovery of the idea. Because she was the first philosopher to talk about this since Aristotle, for over 2,000 years. That your life belongs to you. And that your moral responsibility is to yourself. Your moral responsibility is to live the best life that you can live. To use Aristotle's terms, to, use, to live a flourishing life, to live life to the fullest, to live the best that you can achieve with whatever talents, whatever skills, whatever luck has given you, whatever. It's about you, it's about self-interest. Morality is about self-interest. Not about how you should sacrifice to your neighbor, but about how you can live the best life you can live. What are the principles? that allow you to live the best life that you can live. How to do it. That's what morality should be about. That's what we don't teach our kids. That's what nobody out there teaches. It's how to take responsibility on your life, but not responsibility in a superficial kind of way in which Republicans often talk about it, but really responsibility of your life. Everything in your life, from who you are, what you want, what job you have, and how you deal with yourself and with the people around you, and everything. Taking complete ownership of who you are and what you are. And that that's your moral responsibility. Deal with others. I mean, it's like, it's like the, the, the issue of workers, right? Yeah, if you treat people badly, what's going to happen? It's going to be bound, bound on you. Your life will be worse. Just like beating your employees will now result in better profits. You treat other people justly. You treat other people right because it's better for you because your life will be better. It's about you, it is about self-interest. Not just economically, not just politically, but morally, ethically. We need to be advocates of, of self, of self-interest. Now what kind of self-interest? Because what about this line cheating, stealing stuff? Well, not enlightened self-interest, that's a wimpy term. Wimpy term. It, it was a term invented for people to kind of keep it Keep the altruism, and, and altruism, by the way, does not mean being nice to people. Altruism is a term invented by Augustine Comte, C-O-M-T-E, a philosopher in the 19th century, French philosopher, and it means self-sacrifice. It means putting the well-being of others before your own. It means serving others. That's what altruism means. And like self-interest was a term that people who kind of liked self-interest but didn't want to give up on their altruism created. What creates all the values we have there? From the alcohol over there, to the mirror, to the light, to the camera, to the mic, to your clothes, to the food you're eating. What makes all that possible? Rational thought. Your mind. You don't have a gene that tells you how to do agriculture. You don't have a gene that tells you how to ferment wheat into alcohol. You don't have a gene for electronics. All that has to be worked out. The guy who invented agriculture, the guy who figured out agriculture, saw the seed drop to the ground, water, a plant grew up. That was like the Einstein of his day. That is not self-evident. Not self-evident. Somebody had, and it probably took thousands of years of human existence for somebody to observe it, to figure that out. That was a great scientist. But then it took a great businessman to take that principle and turn it to fields in which you could grow stuff and sell it. That's the entrepreneur. Those are huge innovations and the innovations of the mind. You know, if you look at your neighbor, I like to do these exercises with groups like this. You, you look particularly, particularly good for this. So look at your neighbor. <laughs> what does that mean? There's a really pathetic animal sitting next to you. <laughs> pathetic. Slow, weak, no claws, no fangs. You ever tried biting into a bison? We have a Actually, yes. A live one? Running? <laughs> We're not equipped to survive in, the, in nature out there. The only thing that equips us to survive is our mind. They can build bow and arrows and traps and 
and knife for cutting off the hides and fire for cooking the meats. I mean, that doesn't come out of nowhere. It comes out of here. So self-interest is guided by reason, is guided by rationality. So rational self-interest. And what's anti-rationality is the lying, cheating, and stealing. Because rationality depends on what? On facts. On reality. Dishonesty is a distortion of facts. It's bad for your own mind. And when do we gain our self-esteem? As human beings, how do we gain that, you know, happiness requires a certain self-esteem, a certain sense of my worthiness, my ability. Where do you get that self-esteem from? What, what, where, do you get, where does that come from? Right. Getting ribbons. In school, right? When they give everybody ribbons, that gives them self-esteem. Yeah. Gold stars. Living in current reality. Affirming your values. Yeah, affirming your values, but you know, what does it mean to live in Kagura? It means creating. It means challenging yourself and achieving challenges, but it means deep down the knowledge that you are capable of taking care of yourself in this world. That you are providing for yourself. Let me tell you, the biggest victims of welfare are the welfare recipients. Because they will never have self-esteem. Trapped. They will ne they're trapped. Exactly, they're trapped. That's a great word. They're trapped. Because they will never have this feeling, I can take care of myself. No. They have in their back of mind, I am such a pathetic human being that I am dependent on strangers to provide for me for the rest of my life. Nobody can be happy under those terms. Nobody can ever achieve pride, can ever achieve self-esteem. We get our self-esteem from our work. <laughs> not for family, not for friends, but primarily from our work. We spend most of our time at work. Right? We say we love, you know, we, we, we do a good speech about family, right? But how many of you actually spend more time with your family than w with work? Now, I'm not talking about those people who, whose work is family, which is a legitimate thing. But most of us don't. Because work is where you get your self-esteem. Work is where you're going to attain your happiness. Work is where you get that sense, I am worthy. I can take care of myself and the people I care about and people I love. If you deny people work, if you deny people the ability to be productive as the welfare state does, you destroy their ability to ever have self-esteem. That's why one of the first things, one of the first things a good administration would get rid of is minimum wage laws. All of them. Because the victim of minimum wage laws are teenagers. You know what unemployment rate is, is among those aged 16 to 24 in the United States today? It's 18%, but among black teenagers, it's 25%. And the reason is they live in the inner city. There are no jobs. They are unskilled because of the... Don't get me started on public education. Because of public education, which they sub, they're the bigger victims than anybody else are, and so they're not worth 8.75 an hour. They just can't produce at that level. So they will never find a job because nobody can legally employ them at six bucks an hour, which is what they're worth. Child labor laws contribute to that too. Child labor laws, which are which are being enforced today in a ridiculous way by the Obama administration, but all of them should be gone. So, what we need is a morality of self-interest, which Rand is, which Rand provides us a morality of rational self-interest, a morality which tells you that your moral responsibility is think of making your life the best that it could be over a lifetime. And I like to tell people, being self-interested, being selfish, is hard work. Hard work. It's not about, I feel like that money, so I'm just going to take it. That's not self-interested. It's about figuring out how to make that money. It's about figuring out today how I'm going to live the rest of my life to maximize my happiness to make my life the best life that it can be. That's hard work. That's not easy, I don't know, lots of uncertainty. I have to plan, I have to think about what kind of, what, what education I need to get, what kind of profession I want to go into, how I'm going to work when I go into that profession, how much time I'm going to put into it, do I want a family, how I'm going to deal with family. This is hard stuff. Who are my friends, who shouldn't be my friends, how much should I drink, <laughs> All One important line. decisions. <laughs> well, with this administration. Yeah. <laughs> Hard work. That's the kind of morality we want. 
And that's what we need to advocate for. That's what we need. We need to capture them all high ground. We need them all high ground to be ours. Because the fact is that once you can gain them all high ground, once you can have a culture of people pursuing their self-interest, rationally, long-term, what kind of political system do they want? Why? Because they want to be left alone. Capitalism just means, by the way, leaving you alone. <laughs> Government leaves you alone. That's capitalism. Under capitalism, if you want to be a socialist, that's okay. <laughs> you can get a few friends of yours who want to be socialists with you, and you can go start a commune. Nobody will stop you. As long as you're not forcing other people to do stuff, you can be a commie. You can. That's the beauty of freedom. The whole point of capitalism is we don't enforce capitalism. We just leave you alone. You can do what you want. As long as you don't violate other people's rights. And why is it important not to violate other people's rights? If we believe in reason and rationality, what's the enemy of reason? What's the enemy of rational thought? Force. 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 Guns. Fists. Coercion. What do we want to extract from society? Coercion. Only reason we should have a government. And I think we should have. I'm not an anarchist. I believe we should have a government. I believe it's a necessary good because it does one thing, which is good. Take coercion out of society. Protect individual rights. That's all it should do. So it should have a police force, a military, a judicial system. That's it. Leave you alone. That's what government should do. Protect you from crooks and criminals and otherwise leave you alone. That comes straight out of a rational, self-interested morality. There's not much more you need to explain. Because I don't want, if I, if I really care about myself, my life, being the best human being I can be, I don't want my mother government sitting on my shoulder paternalistically telling, don't drink that soda. <laughs> don't eat that. Don't take that. I don't want the government telling me what I can and cannot do. Anybody with self-esteem, can you imagine George Washington walking through TSA? <laughs> It is a sign of how pathetic culturally this country has become. Yeah. That we tolerate this nonsense. <laughs> Can you imagine a country in where the ambassador is just killed in Libya and what we want to do is prosecute the guy who made some stupid video rather than going after the people who did it? That's the country we live in. So we'd rather go through metal detectors and all these scanners and see everything rather than actually kill the bastards. Which is the alternative. Can you imagine Thomas Jefferson filling out his 1040? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, think about it. Think about what it took for those guys to found this country. They stood up against the mightiest empire that, human, that humans have ever known. And they said, we're willing to die. We're willing to put our lives in our sacred honor. To fight for what? To fight against a tea tax. We have higher T taxes today. Not to mention the million other taxes we have, the metal detectors we have, the regulations we have. We have a far more oppressive government on us today than the founders could have imagined. Never mind King George. King George is a wimp. Let's compare to what we have today. And yet they put everything on the line for what? What principle were they willing to fight? Liberty. For liberty, but what did it mean? And, and here the most important document in human history, the most important political document in human history, is not the Constitution. It is the Declaration of Independence, because you cannot understand the Constitution without it. It sets the foundation. They were willing to put their life on the line, put everything on the line. And it was likely they were going to lose their life, by the way. This was, wasn't a sure thing at all, right? For what? For the right of each one of us to our own life. That was a revolutionary concept. Before that, your life belonged to whom? The state, the tribe, the king, the pope, somebody else, not you. They said, no, uh, my life belongs to me. That's pretty self-interested. And then they said, you know, you have a right, an inalienable right, by the way. The inalienable means cannot be taken away from you. 99% of the people can vote against you. It cannot be taken away. It means no democracy can take it away. Nobody can take it away. It's been taken away already. We have a right to our life. We have a right to our own liberty, which means to come up with whatever ideas we want and go and act on them in reality. And unless we're hurting somebody else, nobody has a right to stop us. 
And in the most profound and in the most self-interested statement in political history, each one of us has a right to pursue our own happiness. Now, if we want to win, if we want to win, that is what we need to bring back. That is what we need to fight for. Yes. The inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yes. Thank you all.